And we'll get into the scripture this morning. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, go ahead and open up to, uh, well, we're going to be a little over. You want to go to 1 Corinthians and put a bookmark next to this. That'll get you going. So we're talking about his glory today. We're talking about God's glory. The glory of God isn't just a, a feeling or an event or an Old Testament experience. It's a spiritual tsunami of everything containing the character of God. It's a spiritual tsunami of everything containing the character of God. Think about the idea of a tsunami of God coming over you. When a tsunami hits you, nothing else much matters, does it? When, when we experience God's glory, nothing else much matters. The word glory is literally translated in the Greek, from the Greek, from a word that means loud, the loudest thing. And, the, and from the Hebrew, it's from a word meaning heavy weight. So when we think about God's glory, we think about the loudest, heaviest, biggest, grandest, most recognizable characteristic of God. That's his glory. That's his glory that, that he can bring and show us his believers. You know, this is this 1 Corinthians key verse that we talked about. This short, simple, direct mandate from God to his church, to his believers, whatever you do, whatever it is you do, anything short of sin, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? All of God's creation is to be absorbed, consumed with this command. Do it for God's glory. Show God's glory. Reflect God's glory in your life. Putting on God's glory. That's, that's what we're reading here. When the angels announced the Savior's birth, they were joined by a heavenly host glorifying God in Luke 2. The shepherds responded by glorifying God following their visit to baby Jesus, right? That's in Luke 2 as well. Even the physical creation of the world screams of God's glory, doesn't it? Everything we see proclaims the glory of God. The book of Exodus, Moses is speaking to God. <clears throat> Moses had a, a, a tent where he would go and speak to God. And he was speaking to God one day in his tent. And uh, Moses Ask God for two things. First thing Moses asked God is, don't leave us, God. Don't ever abandon us. We need you, Lord. The second thing Moses asked God for is, show me your glory. Let me see your glory. So we can say it like this. Moses is saying, God, don't take your glory from us. In fact, give us more. Don't, don't take the glory you've shown us already. Add to it. That's what we want, Lord. Exodus 33, verses 15 through 18 says this. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people of the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do. I will indeed do what you have asked. For I look, I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, "Then show me your glorious presence." Moses wanted to experience the tsunami. He wanted to be overcome by the glory of God. He didn't want anything to be more important to him or to the people of, of Israel than God. He wanted more. He wanted to know God more. He wanted to be closer to God. Church, that's got to be our desire still. I want to know you more. I want to be closer to you. I want to hear your voice more clearly. I want to experience your glory, Lord. God lovingly showed Moses his glory and gave him an up-close look at his magnificence and brilliance as he passed by and Moses was able to see the, the tail of his of his glory going by. God still gives us 
flashes of his glory. Yeah. I can remember a couple experiences in my life where, where I saw blinks or flashes of his glory. Like that song talked about when uh, the kids were born. When Bella was born, when Gordy was born, I, I witnessed the birth of those kids. I, I, I witnessed the glory of God. It was a blink. It was a flash. I was overcome by emotion. It was overwhelming. I know the moment I got saved that God's mercy poured out on me. And, and I was a bucket of tears. I remember that moment. God's glory flashed before me that moment. He grabbed me by the neck and said, you're, you're not going that way anymore. You're coming here. You're going this way now. I remember that. That's, it was a moment of his glory I experienced. I think we see God's glory in marriage too. I think when, when, when we are living out a godly marriage and, and two are literally becoming one, two things that were different now become one in God, that's a picture of his glory. We do look at creation, sunrises, sunsets, right? A lot of people get up early and stay up late to see those things because you can see God's glory in it. They might not know why, they might not know what the appeal is, but I swear, I swear it's his glory. That's why people want to see those so bad. That's why on vacation people get up at 6 a.m. to see that sunrise over the ocean. There's no better artist. That's right. That's absolutely right. What about, so the kids, Cleo's been on this thing where she likes, she doesn't want to buy flowers, she wants wildflowers growing on the road. So we've been trying to get some wildflowers from the sides of the road lately. And this week the kids wanted to get her a, a bouquet or whatever, a flowers. So they were picking these roadside weeds. Wow, there are some beautiful, intricate weeds. God's glory in these little weeds that we'll drive by a hundred times, 60 miles an hour, and people throw cigarette butts out at, whatever else. And if you look close at them, oh my goodness, you can see the glory of God in these little stupid weeds that are beautiful and have these intricate parts and pieces that it's just like, oh my gosh. I can see his glory. Creation screams. Creation follows this, this 1 Corinthians 10 command. Creation does it so much better than we do. Showing God's glory. Absorbed with the, the command to show God's glory everywhere it goes. I believe God wants to show us his glory for a purpose too. It's not just so we can, yeah, hey, that's cool. It, it, there's a purpose for his glory. When we experience God's glory, when we see moments, when we see flashes or blinks or, or strikes of his glory, it's to grow our confidence in what he said. It's to build our faith in who he is. It's to encourage us to perfect the confidence that we have in him and in the work of his son on the cross as the perfect and sufficient sacrifice for all of us, right? When we see God's glory, it should en encourage us to think he can do that with a weed on the side of the road. How much more does he care for me? How much more does he care for you? That should remind us of his glory. Should, we should see the, his love for us in his glory. Jesus wanted his disciples to have this kind of confidence in him. We've been talking to Mark lately, several weeks down the road. Jesus kind of grilling his disciples in the world and everybody around him. Who, who am I? Who do you say I am? It started with the old uh, religious leaders from Jerusalem who came and, and were, were really nitpicking Jesus' ministry, right? They were nitpicking him because he healed on the Sabbath and he, uh, he, uh, what, he, he did all sorts of things. He drove out demons. And so they, they called him Satan. They called him a, a Samaritan. They called him everything they could think of except for for the Son of God. They wouldn't understand his identity. They couldn't understand his identity. So the last several weeks, Mark has grouped together, in the Gospel of Mark, he's grouped together several, several stories, similar stories about people seeking, Jesus seeking to share his identity with people. From the Pharisees who wouldn't believe, then Jesus asked the disciples, who, who does the world say that I am? And his disciples said, some say that you're, or some say that you're, uh, prophet Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're this prophet or that prophet or this prophet. And then Jesus looked at his disciples. Remember this last week? He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter had this moment of clarity from God. And Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you are correct, Peter. 
God has given you that, that insight. God has given you that knowledge. And then Peter turned around and, and said something down and God or Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Stop. Stop talking while you're ahead. So even Peter, in that moment of clarity, in that moment of understanding, okay, I see who Jesus is, I see his glory, he, he lost it that fast. A fleeting, a fleeting knowledge of who Jesus was. Even at that, the disciple didn't truly understand who Jesus was or what his mission was. Even when Jesus explained his mission, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and face many trials and difficulties. I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be killed on a cross. And the disciples just didn't really get it. They didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't think that was right. They understood maybe that he was the Messiah, but they were still thinking, warrior king coming to free us from our bondage. They're coming, Jesus is coming to, to beat Rome and to give us our freedom. Well, Jesus came to give freedom, but not the kind of freedom they were hoping for. Jesus came as a suffering servant. Remember the title of Mark? We started this book of Mark way back in January. Do you remember the title of the book that I, I think our sermon is based on? Jesus the Suffering Servant. Servant Savior. That's Jesus in the book of Mark. Mark presents Jesus as this servant, Savior. And, and that's what the disciples had a hard time wrapping their minds around. How can Messiah be a suffering Savior? He must be a victorious Savior. And Jesus says, I'm not victorious. I'm victorious over sin. I'm victorious over death. But you're going to deal with the earth, the world and stuff. I'm going to give you eternity. But I'm not here to, to fight the battles right in front of you. So the disciples couldn't get that. They couldn't reconcile a Messiah that wasn't to give him freedom over Rome. So Jesus chose in his mercy, in his love, to take his three disciples, three inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to a mountaintop, and he had something for them. And this is going to be Mark 9. This is our, our scripture from Mark today. Verse 9, verse, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, it says this. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' Jesus's appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. But Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us, wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters or memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this as he, he said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So here Jesus separates, separates out his three inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John, and takes them up the mountain to experience, to share this amazing experience with them. Now this was not the first time Jesus did some inner circle stuff. It wasn't favorites. It wasn't this and that. Jesus just has an inner circle who he showed a little bit more to. He shared a little bit more with. And this wasn't the first time that he'd be this. It wouldn't be the last time that Jesus would do this. And I really believe these types of inner circle experiences are what qualify those three to be pillars of the first church. To be the beacons of, of the first church. This meeting between Moses and Elijah and Jesus proves a couple things, a few things, to those disciples and to us as we read it now. And I just want to go over those three things this morning that we can know by reading the scripture, that we is proven to us by reading the scripture. The first thing that we can prove is this, Jesus is the Son of God. You may say, well, yeah, we know that. Yeah, that's obvious. But there's still a whole lot of people who don't truly believe this who don't truly live by this. Jesus is the Son of God. He's not a son. He's not a good teacher. He's not a great guy. He's God. 
For God, only Son of God, fully God and fully man, is the only one. This transfiguration provides further evidence that Jesus is indeed the divine Son of God. But it's not coincidental this happened in close proximity. Six days later, after the moment that Jesus says, Peter, you are correct, I am the Messiah. And six days later, Jesus takes him to the mountain to prove it. Jesus didn't just say it and just, there it is. He came in proof. This is your proof, Peter. This is your proof, John. This is Jesus, the one who left heaven's glory to rescue us. The appearance of Moses and Elijah with Jesus is really significant, too. Think about this for a second. Who was it that people thought Jesus was? Remember? They said, oh, he's, he's Elijah. Oh, he's, he's this guy. He's that guy from the, old, from the old days. He's from the Old Testament. And so here, Jesus appears with the prophet Elijah. He appears with Moses. Remember, Moses was acquainted with the law, right? Moses, God gave the law through Moses. And so Moses came down the, the mountaintop of tablets of the law, right? Moses was the lawgiver through God gave to Moses. But God gave the law through Moses. And then the prophet Elijah, who's considered one of the greatest prophets ever. And so you get the law and you get the prophet. And those two things, people still, people still in Jerusalem and in Israel held on to those two things. They said, the law is, is all we have. And the prophets are all the ones that told us about it. These are our laws. This is what we have. This is where our faith, this is where our, our religion is, is based on. These two things, the law and the prophets. And here Jesus is appearing with, with both the law and the prophet. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, didn't he? In John 1, 17, it says, The law was given through Moses, but God's revealing love and faithfulness came through Jesus. Jesus says, I came not to delete the law, not to get rid of the law, but to fill the law, fulfill the law. The law showed us how simple we are, and Jesus came and gave us an answer. You are simple. You are all, everyone is born in sin, but here's a way out. Jesus is his name. And Elijah, the mighty figure of the Old Testament, he was a great prophet. And his appearance with Moses testified that Jesus fulfilled the prophets as well. So he filled the law and the prophets. Don't misunderstand, this is Jesus speaking. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purposes. And so as we see Jesus with the two men on his, his left and his right, God saying, this is my son. He's the completed work of of what I began here. The voice of God the Father gave further confirmation to the calling of the sonship of Jesus. He acknowledged that Jesus, what Jesus said and what Jesus did, pleased the Father. The second part that I want to see, I want us to get that's proof is this, God has given all authority to Jesus. Jesus, God said, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. He didn't say, listen to all three of these guys. They're really good. All three of these guys are my guys. Listen to all three. He said, listen to him. This is, this is who you need to hear now. This is my son. In the presence of Moses and of the prophet Elijah, God said, this is who I want you to hear. This is who you listen to. And what did Jesus say? I come to fulfill what they did. Jesus didn't erase what they did or change what they did. He fulfilled what they did. God says, this is my son, the man, God, Jesus. And you must listen to him. He is the one I've given all authority to. All authority now and all authority in heaven lies with Christ. He is the bridge. He is our bridge from the natural to the supernatural. He is the, the bridge from earth to heaven. To quote that Zeppelin, he's the stairway to heaven, right? The Gospel of John says it like this. Oops. The Father loves his Son, and he has put everything into his hands. Everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remains under 
God's angry judgment. The transfiguration proves that Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the only one who can save us from sin. He is the Messiah. But not this conquering King Messiah. He's the suffering servant Messiah. This time when Jesus came, he came to save the world through his death, right? Through his death and his resurrection. When Jesus comes back, and he's coming back, he'll be coming as a victorious king. He'll be coming as, as the one with the, the sword coming out of his mouth. And he'll defeat all those who oppose God at that time. And he's going to be victorious. And guess what, church? The book of Revelation says we're, we're back there on a horse, too, following the king in. We don't really have to do much fighting, but we sure do get to watch him do it. Amen. That would be an amazing moment, won't it? King Jesus, the warrior, sets everything right once and for all. This was a big hurdle I mentioned earlier that the disciples had to get over. From the moment they were born, from the moment they could understand the Torah and, and be taught, they were told the Messiah will come and give us freedom. The Messiah will come and give us victory over, over our oppressors. And so for the, the disciples to shift their understanding of what a Messiah was going to do at that moment was such a key piece of this. Because there was still something in the back of their head that said, Jesus is a great guy, but why aren't we free yet? Why, why, why hasn't he defeated Rome? Why hasn't he overcome the things of the world? And so we see in this transfiguration, God says he is doing what I told him to do. He is who I want him to be right now. For them to shift their understanding was critical to going forward as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we kind of think of it like this. A lot of times we may come to Jesus and say, all right, Jesus, I'll put my faith in you, but I need you to... To get everything right. I need you to fill my bank account. I need you to make the house. And, and, and if that's our mindset, if that's why we came to Jesus, for him to have victory in our life, monetarily, momentarily, flesh, stuff, consumerist victory, we're going to be let down. Because Jesus doesn't say, I'll come and fix your, your social standing. He says, I'll come and fix your spiritual standing. You're going to still suffer. You're still going to go without sometimes. You're still going to have problems in this world because this world doesn't mean our home. But he said, you know what? I, I will be there. I'll be with you in your struggles. And you'll have eternity with me. It's kind of the same idea. You know, we're not following Jesus for what he can do for us right now. We're following Jesus because he called us by name. And he's promised us eternity with him. Now, he will fix some things right now. Absolutely. We don't follow him because of that. We don't follow, we don't love Jesus because of what he can do for us. And there's one more thing this transfiguration proves to us, and it's this. God is faithful. This is so important, church. God is faithful. Maybe you've been praying for something in your life for a long time. Maybe you've been praying for kids to find the Lord. Maybe you've been praying for your family to come back together for whatever, for for our, our, our loved ones. Maybe we've been praying a long time for that. We still haven't heard the answer. We still haven't seen an answer. Let me say this. Moses asked God to see his glory 1,500 years before the transfiguration. 1,500 years. Moses said, God, let me see your glory. And God showed him the west behind him as he crossed past. But God was still fulfilling that promise to Moses in the transfiguration. As Moses said, God, let me see your glory. God said, Moses, this is my ultimate glory right here. It's my son. My only begotten son. And he's the one that's going to connect sinful man back to me. He's the one that's going to make all things right. He's the one that's going to set right my creation, who is perfect in creation, who fell into sin, and now I've sent my one only son to bring it back to perfection. This is my glory, Moses. His name is Jesus. And maybe that's why Moses was there that day. Maybe that's why God invited Moses to see it, because Moses asked to see God's glory. And so 1,500 years later, God still answered Moses' prayer. We, think we all have testimonies of, of answered prayer from generations ago. Grandmas and grandmas who prayed for your salvation, I promise they did. 
And maybe they didn't see it. Maybe they didn't experience it in their life. But yeah, here you are, walking by faith in the name of Jesus. Maybe because grandma prayed. Maybe because great-grandma prayed. Maybe because your great-great-grandma prayed for his, his whole family lineage to be saved. I can promise you are an answered prayer for someone. And don't ever forget God's people. And just because we don't see an answer right away, or it doesn't make sense right away, we know that He's good. And we know that He's faithful. We know that He, he hears our prayers. You know, that's something that the, the, the um, Psalm 5, that we read this morning for, for open prayer time, that's one thing that Psalm 5 said. He hears your prayers. Don't ever doubt that for a second. God hears your cries. He hears your prayers. He knows what's going on in your heart. So when you feel like you're abandoned, you feel like you're alone, you feel like, gosh, Lord, is this ever going to work out? He knows. He hears. And he's faithful. And maybe he's just trying to get some patience in our hearts. I know maybe for me that's the answer. He's trying to grow patience in me through his faithfulness. You know, when well, next time you get discouraged, next time you get scared of, of what lies ahead, use that fear as an opportunity to practice faith in, in what God's going to do. I don't see it. I can't even smell it. I can't hear it. But I know it. When we start walking like that, you're ready. You're ready to see some things move. This event, this transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain, had ongoing, long-lasting implications on the lives of his disciples. It was no mistake that those three men were the ones Jesus chose to go to the mountaintop. And as we know, Jesus would come down off the mountain. And he'd minister for a little while longer, and he would go to the cross, right? He would be whipped. He'd be crucified. He would die a sinner's death. He would also raise from the grave three days later. And now he lives forevermore at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Advocating for you. Think, I love that scene in my mind. It may not be exactly, and it's probably not perfect, but I see God in his throne with his whole creation. And here's Jesus saying, man, Sally loves you, God. Man, Cleo loves you. Cleo put her faith in me a long time ago. Man, Margie, Margie's believed in you for a long time. Margie's believed in me for a long time. God, she's such a good daughter. And on and on, and gushing about each one of us. Not about our sin, not about our shortcomings, not about the things we've done wrong, but about our faith that we put in Him. Advocating at the hand of the Father for you and for me. And this is what Peter said years later in his life. As after Jesus was, was ascended back to heaven, years later, after Peter ministered and planted the first church there in Jerusalem, this is what Peter had to say about that experience. He says, we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from the Father, from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved Son." brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. So here's Peter, years later, saying it was that moment that gave me confidence. It was when I saw his glory that finally made me believe. It. That made me no more doubts, no more, no more uh, wiggle room in my faith. I knew that what Jesus said was true when I saw his glory. And so church, when we see those flickers of glory, when we see those flashes of glory in our life, whether it's the, the birth of a child, whether it's a, a roadside flower, whether it's a sunrise or a sunset, or a, a, a marriage of two people who have laid aside their selfish differences and have come together to be one under God. 
whatever it is, wherever you see God's glory, let that be an encouragement to you that Jesus is who he said he is. And that all that the prophets said about Jesus did happen. And it's still happening. You know, there'll be certain moments that God gives you just for you. And when you try to explain it, it'll sound crazy. That's okay. That was for you. That's yours. And he gives you to remind you that. That Jesus is Lord. And through Jesus, you belong to him. You are saved. And you will be with him forever and eternity. So we look forward to Christ's return, right, church? We look forward to that day as we follow Jesus on horseback and, and watch him defeat the evil powers of the world. So let's, let's be able to look out for some glory and let God's glory be reflected in us. So living it out, when we start today, be able to look out for God's glory in your life because it's there. I promise you it's there. It may not be on the mountaintop with a cloud and, and Jesus' face showing as white as snow, but it's going to be somehow, somewhere, there's going to be a blink, a flash, a moment of God's glory. When we look for things, we often see them. It's like buying a yellow pickup truck. You start seeing yellow pickup trucks everywhere you go. It's like buying a silver minivan. You see a minivan everywhere you go. When you're looking for God's glory, you start seeing it everywhere you go. Reflect God's glory to the world. Maybe God wants to show his glory through you. Through your love to someone who, who isn't lovely. For having mercy for someone who, who's never shown mercy to anyone else. For caring for somebody who's never been cared for before. You know, Randy mentioned that at the beginning in, in the devotional. When we care for people who, who are neglected and, and ignored by the world, I think that's when we can show God's glory the most. Amen? All right, let's open this up for, for chat. What are, what are some thoughts coming out of the Transfiguration Council?